chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Today's video is a little bit of, um, well, extracurricular activity, I guess you'd call it. It's not the normal run of things. Uh, the next planned video is uh, going to be a guitar review, uh, but the guitar isn't here and probably isn't going to be here until at least tomorrow. So I found myself at a loose end and thought I'd uh, throw this one together. Um, I've been planning to do this for a while because a while ago I saw a YouTube video with a very well-known or pretty well-known YouTube guitarist and that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to uh, give you any more details than that. Uh, and this guy who is a fantastic guitar player and knows what he's talking about most of the time uh, got onto the topic of amplifier electronics and it quickly became apparent that uh, he knew the square root of bugger all about what he was talking about on that particular topic. Uh, it was like, you know, the, well, the reason, of course, why valve amplifiers sound much warmer is because the valves have a heating element inside them. Really. <laughs> it was a bit like watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You know that scene where Sir Bedivere goes uh, to King Arthur, he says... Uh, and that, my liege, is how come we know the world to be banana-shaped. It was that level of nonsense, basically. So I thought I'd put the um, my response out there to uh, this. And if you're at all interested in uh, what's going on inside a, a guitar amplifier, if you've ever been confused by terms like Class A amplification, Class B uh, rectifier, dual rectifier, any of that sort of stuff that uh, gets bandied around quite a lot and not been, not really had a clue what it's uh, what it means, then this video will, uh, along the way, will answer those questions. But first of all, uh, how do you know that I'm uh, qualified to talk about this? Well. Here's some info on my background. Okay, from 1984 to 1987, I studied here, Raycastle College of Marine Electronics on the shores of Lake Windermere. And there's the room I used to live in, G-Deck. Still remember it well. Uh, this is me back then. Uh, what I was doing was studying to be a Merchant Navy Radio Officer. And the course was pretty much equal parts uh, electronics and telecommunications. Hours and hours and hours of doing Morse code. And a little bit of seamanship as well. And I could regularly be found elbow deep in pieces of equipment like this. The Marconi Conqueror Ship's Transmitter, which as you can see is absolutely chock full of valves so that sort of I think establishes my credentials for knowing what's going on inside any valve circuit including those inside a guitar amplifier. So there you go I think that establishes that um, I'm qualified to speak on such matters and let's get straight down to it with a bit of a look at how valve circuits work. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is a diode valve or tube and it consists of two electrodes, an anode and a cathode. Two electrodes, hence diode, you see. Uh, those electrodes are encased in a sealed glass envelope or tube uh, inside which there is a vacuum. Now, what we do is apply heat to the cathode and this is done by a heating element which is also encased in the tube uh, but I've left out of this diagram just for simplicity's sake. This is incidentally what you can see glowing when you look at a, a valve amp uh, running. And because of the vacuum inside the tube, uh, what happens is, with the uh, heat on the cathode, a cloud of electrons, which are negatively charged particles, uh, floats off the cathode. Now, if we apply what my old college lecturer used to call an FBV, which stands for a flipping big voltage, apparently, uh, to the anode, then opposites attract and the negatively charged electrons are dragged up towards the positive charge on the anode. 
However, if you put a, a negative uh, charge on the anode, or possibly a positive charge on the cathode, or both, what happens is that the negative charge on the anode will repel the negatively charged electrons back to the cathode, or if there's a, a positive uh, voltage on the cathode, uh, that positive voltage will attract the uh, electrons back to the cathode. In other words, current will flow in this direction. Uh, an electric current is nothing more than electrons moving uh, but it won't flow in this direction uh, it's kind of like um, a hinged flap in a water pipe like this you can see that current can flow in that direction but it's blocked in that direction and this is the origin really of the term valve so now let's add a third electrode this is the grid and this is a wire mesh which sits in between the anode and the cathode and what we do is we put a small negative charge on the grid. This is known as the bias. Whenever you hear someone talking about having their amp rebiased, it's basically having that uh, grid voltage adjusted in some way. And this will cause some of the electrons that are hitting that negative uh, charge on the grid to be repelled back towards the cathode. This means that if we add a signal on top of that um, grid, bias voltage uh, we can vary that uh, we can vary that voltage and it leads to a proportional variation in the current flow here because we're varying how many electrons are getting repelled back to the cathode or put another way if we put a signal on the grid like that it leads to a proportional but much larger uh, change in the anode current Basically, we've taken a signal and we've made it bigger, which is kind of how uh, an amplifier circuit works. Now, there are basically two types of uh, amplification. This is class A amplification, where the entire signal is amplified by valve A, as we'll call it. Uh, this is quite inefficient, though, because for Class A operation, the valve has to be open to some extent all the time, uh, which is inefficient. And let's face it, in the 1950s and 60s, people weren't too bothered about um, carbon footprints and so on. They, they just wanted an amp that produced more volume. Uh, a Class A amplifier will tend to produce less uh, output because it's wasting some of its energy by always keeping that uh, that gate open all the time so we come up with this idea here the push pull circuit also known as class b amplification where part of the signal uh, is amplified by valve a and the bottom half of the signal is amplified by valve b uh, and this is potentially where we encounter a problem uh, crossover distortion where one valve is is switching off and the other valve is switching on um, if that isn't absolutely timed to perfection then you are going to get some distortion of the signal there and also um, as the valve is turning on it may not respond in a linear fashion so you, you're potentially going to get uh, some kind of distortion there and that is the price that you pay for an increased uh, output for the same number of valves in the back of your amp uh, there is a compromise which I'm not going to go into here called class AB amplification where there is overlap between the uh, two valves that are switching on and off but uh, to all intents and purposes that's just a variation on class B amplification. And all of this is why a class A amplifier like this one sounds markedly different from a class B amplifier like this one or this one. It's well acknowledged that um, Jim Marshall, when he began making amplifiers, used the same basic circuit as Leo Fender had used when he uh, began making amplifiers. Apparently it was uh, a circuit that was in the public domain. It was taken from a, an electronics textbook, I believe. The reason why Marshall amplifiers sound different to Fender amplifiers, of course, is because the components that were available in the USA that Leo Fender was using, the types of valve and so on, weren't available in the UK. So Jim Marshall had to source the nearest equivalent components and tweak the circuit um, accordingly, uh, resulting in uh, a different sound. 
So there you go. That is the basis of how a valve amplifier circuit works. So why do valve amplifiers sound better than solid state amplifiers? Okay, let's begin by looking at the difference between how a transistor, a solid state component, behaves when compared to a tube or a valve. At the top of the screen there you can see the response curve for a solid state component, a, a transistor basically. And you can see that it is basically linear. Okay, um, If you have a, a circuit which is amplifying by a factor of 10, you put 1 volt in and you will get 10 volts out. I'll put 10 volts in, you'll get 100 volts out, etc. Et and this is why a transistor amplifier will generally give a flatter response um, to the signal that you're putting into it. It just takes what you give it and makes it bigger. Uh, a faithful reproduction at uh, a bigger volume, basically. You'll also notice that uh, when you drive a transistor amplifier past the point at which it's designed to operate, it will distort, and, well, all amplifiers will distort. But the way a transistor amplifier does it is uh, it just plateaus, and we'll see the effect that that will have on the sound in a moment or two. But if we look at the tube amp, uh, then you can see the response curve is anything but linear. It is always going to colour the sound somewhat, uh, which is one of the things that uh, makes a, a tube amp sound the way it does compared to a solid state amp. But the real difference comes when we look at the signal that you get out from these circuits. Uh, if we take the original uh, signal waveform here, and you can see I've marked on the cutoff point where the valve is going to uh, basically go into clipping, uh, where uh, the circuit is giving as much as it's got to give, then with a transistor, because of that plateau that happens when you reach that cutoff point, you get a very, very uh, hard edge to the clipping, uh, which is literally what gives the sound a hard edge. It's what makes um, a lot of solid state amps sound quite harsh. However, when you drive a valve amp circuit uh, past the point at which it begins to clip, then because of the different response curve, which avoids that uh, kind of hard plateau at the top, then it distorts in a much softer way and has a more generally thought to be pleasing sound uh, when you drive that kind of circuit into distortion. So there you go. That's what's going on inside the amplifier circuit part of a, of a valve amplifier. Uh, but uh, we keep hearing this term rectifier being uh, bandied around quite a lot. So what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. Okay, rectifiers. Um, basically, it's all about converting one type of electricity into another. Uh, this is the mains voltage that comes out of the socket on your wall. It's called AC, or alternating current, and what's happening is that it's swinging back and forth between a positive and a negative voltage. In the UK, it does that 50 times per second. I think in the US and other parts of the world, it does it 60 times per second. Anyway, uh, basically, what we need uh, to run the amplifier circuits is direct current, or DC. Uh, basically, electricity which stays positive. Uh, it's not swinging back and forth all the time. So we need to convert that AC current into a DC current. And the way we do that is by using our old friend the diode, which if you can remember allows current to flow in one direction but not the other. Uh, here's a little reminder. You'll see I've also drawn the electrical symbol for a diode. That, that's kind of what you'd see in a circuit diagram. Um, so current will flow in that direction but not in that direction. And if we connect uh, four diodes together into this configuration, we get something called a bridge rectifier circuit. The act of turning AC into DC is known as rectification. And what happens is if you put an AC mains voltage across the two terminals on the left hand side, then on the right hand side uh, what you get is a pulsating DC voltage. It's still a DC voltage, it's uh, not flipping from negative to positive, but it is kind of pulsating and we don't want that. We want it to be um, you know, smooth. So how do we turn this 
uh, into a smooth DC voltage? Well, we do it by the use of this component called a capacitor, which basically is a, a component which stores electrical charge. So uh, we connect the smoothing capacitor, as it's called, across the two terminals on the right-hand side of the page, and what happens is that as the uh, voltage is building up like that, the capacitor is charging up and then on this part of the cycle it's discharging slowly so you get a smoothed DC voltage with a small amount of ripple. This is where basically the capacitor has discharged to slightly below the peak value of the AC current and basically that leads to a, a, a little bump in the road and if your original AC current is happening at uh, 60 cycles per second, then that ripple will be at 60 cycles per second. And that is sometimes what gives you the 60 cycle, or if you're in the UK, 50 cycle hum that you sometimes hear. It's often a sign that your smoothing capacitor is on its way out. Um, or it's maybe not the correct value capacitor in the first place and needs to be changed anyway. So that is the basis of what a rectifier is and what it does now that explains what a rectifier does but you know the, there are different ways of doing it um, basically the choice is between solid state or silicon components and valve components and if we look at this response curve here for uh, a silicon diode uh, compared to a valve diode you will see that essentially the valve diode wakes up a lot slower uh, when it's um, you know when when you need to draw current through it. So imagine you hit a big thrangy open position power cord. Uh, the amplifier circuit inside your amp says, "Yeah, I need some juice here to make this nice and loud for him." And a solid state component says, "Right away, sir," and delivers the power. Um, whereas a valve amplifier or a valve rectifier, rather. What that does is it says, oh, hang on a sec, yeah, I'll be there in a moment. And, you know, it takes longer to deliver the power. We're talking fractions of a second here. You know, it's not like the note will fade in. But what happens with a valve rectifier circuit is because the power is delivered slower, that means that there is a, a lovely bloom to the note. It, it just seems to blossom. It's like some people refer to it as a, as a bit of sag in the uh, in the response of, of the amplifier and you know an amplifier like the famous Mesa Boogie dual rectifier has two circuits it has a valve rectifier circuit and a solid state rectifier circuit and I believe you can switch between them which you know gives you two different types of response uh, to the uh, to the way you play so that pretty much is what's going on inside a valve amplifier I hope you've all be a little bit uh, simplified it has to be said uh, I hope you found this informative useful and maybe even a bit inspiring I don't know if there's anything inspiring about electronics but um, I studied it and found it interesting so if you've enjoyed the video please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell and give me a like while you're at it and I'll be back very very soon with a uh, more guitar focused video and just as always I will mention that if you would like some tailored one-to-one -one guitar tuition then give me a shout via the details at the end of this video if you live on Teesside in the northeast of England you can come along for a face-to-face -face lesson or wherever you are in the world you can have a lesson via Skype and with that I'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for your time thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you all again next time around bye for now folks